Good morning. Good morning. I hope you all are doing well. Uh, let's begin with the reading from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Hear the word of the Lord. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning home, seated in his chariot. Uh, He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does a prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we're grateful for your words. We're grateful uh, that... Out of your word, we understand that we're part of a story much bigger than ourselves, that we are people who are called to live a different way of life, empowered by your life. I'm grateful for the work of Gabby and Haley uh, in the way that they they show us that in the way they're connecting with children. Lord, this morning I'm asking as we dwell in your word that you're with us. You bring us words of strength and comfort and words to spur us on to be more like you. And it's your son's name I pray. Amen. So growing up in uh, me, when I was growing up through elementary, junior high, high school, college, master's work, and even into my PhD, I was probably the kid and the guy that y'all all got annoyed with. Whenever a teacher would ask a question, my hand was always the first one up. Whether I had the right answer or not, When I had a conversation with my friends, I would pretentiously correct their pronunciation or the facts of some story they were trying to tell. I remember growing up, growing up, going to Lubbock Christian High School, and I had friends from different denominations and churches of Christ, and I'd always be that kid who'd be like, no, you have to be baptized to get to heaven. You can't just invite Jesus into your heart. So I was always that kid trying to help people understand what was right and what was not right. I was that kid. I guess I used to think that having all the right answers, the right facts, and making sure that everyone else did too was important. If only I can know exactly what's going on here and around me, life will go as it should go. But the older I got, and I'm still working on this, but the older I got, the more I found out this really isn't true. Sometimes there are just questions that we can't find the answers to, or at least a satisfying answer to. Maybe asking the right question is much more valuable than having all of the right answers. Asking questions that drive us toward exploring things deeper and take us on journeys of discovery. So in our text today, we find this story, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And it's a great story of faith and conversation. But what really strikes me about this story is that it's also a great story of questions and discovery. So today we're going to look at three good questions 
that the Ethiopian asked Philip on that dry and dusty road south of Jerusalem. That first question the Ethiopian asks, he says, how can I understand unless someone guides me? As the story opens, the eunuch, a relatively important palace official, it sounds like he's almost the CFO in Ethiopia, is in his chariot returning from Jerusalem where he's gone on pilgrimage to worship. And as he's traveling, he's reading scripture. And the Bible uh, often tells us people who are insignificant in the eyes of the world, um, but are royalty in God's eyes, are important. What's interesting about this story is that idea is almost reversed. Here's a man with a royal job in a worldly court who could have gotten the impression from the Bible that he was unwelcome in God's court. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1, it makes plain that any man who um, is mutilated shall not be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Uh, If you continue reading in Deuteronomy, in verse 2, it also says, Those born of an illicit union shall not be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of their descendants shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. I read that because I wanted to bring this home for you all a little bit. So Vanessa's grandfather, whom our oldest son, Van, is named, was born of an illicit union. He was born out of wedlock. So if this law were still in effect today... I guess I could come here, but Vanessa would not be here, and my kids would not be here. These are the kind of barriers that we're talking about, overcoming, that Jesus does for us. So we have this man who's reading the old law, and there's this huge barrier set in front of him. But this eunuch, he's not reading Deuteronomy. He's reading Isaiah. And the prophet gives a more hopeful word. Not only does Isaiah announce that God will recover the remnant that is left of his people from Ethiopia in Isaiah chapter 11. But Isaiah also promises that eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, or excuse me, God in Isaiah says this, eunuchs who keep, keep my Sabbath will be welcome in the house of God and will receive a name better than the sons, than sons and daughters. So which is it? Is it Deuteronomy or is it Isaiah? In or out? Is he welcomed in the household of God or is he not? If he has only the written words of Scripture, it could be argued either way, I suppose. How can this man know what's true? How can he understand unless someone guides him? What he needs is not only somebody who knows Scripture, but somebody who knows the God of Scripture. He needs someone to teach him, someone who's felt the embrace of God, who can read the cold ink on the page in the warm light of God's Spirit. He needs, as all of us do, a Philip to guide him. I have a feeling that we've all been in the same place as this eunuch, reading scripture, trying to make sense of it, trying to figure out why one verse says this and the other says that and how we apply it to our lives. And no matter how pure our hearts are, no matter how hard we search the scriptures, we just can't figure out that one verse. We can all relate to this eunuch. There's one reason, and that's one reason why we come to church together week after week. Not just to encourage each other, but to search the scriptures together and learn from each other. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not standing up here saying I have all the answers. And I'm not saying that everything I see up here is God's truth or the correct interpretation of scriptures. You have to go to a different denomination for somebody to make that claim. Though I do try very hard to be as faithful to the Bible as I can be. But what I am saying is that we need help figuring out the Bible and how its teaching applies to our lives. And the place to find that help, the place to find that person, that Philip, is at the church. I can learn something new about the Bible and God from J.W., from Olga, from Ed, from Tom, or Mark, or Mark, because they bring their own perspective, their own experience, their own wisdom to bear on what we're discussing. Together, we can learn something new from each other as we approach Scripture in community. We can encourage and build up one another as we're trying to be faithful disciples to Christ. How can I understand unless somebody guides me? We all need a little bit of help from time to time. The second question that the eunuch asked Philip is about whom does the prophet say this? The eunuch has been reading the passage in Isaiah that describes someone who like a sheep was led to the slaughter and and in whose humiliation justice was denied. That's Isaiah 53, 
7 and 8. The eunuch asks Philip, about whom is a prophet speaking, himself or someone else? And at this point in the conversation, the eunuch almost surely means, is this only about Isaiah and his situation, or is this passage about me as well? Is this a word from God for someone else, or is this a word from God for me today? As a eunuch, he would fully know well about humiliation and justice denied. And he was wondering if God was speaking to him and to his own experience of being an outcast in Israel. The biblical word is never merely about back then. It is always a word to us, to this moment, to these circumstances. Today, said Jesus in his hometown synagogue in Luke chapter 4, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It turned out to be even better news than the Ethiopian could have ever had imagined. Not only does God know and understand the eunuch's experience of being humiliated and ostracized religiously, Jesus himself took on that lowly and outcast state. What Isaiah says, Philip told the eunuch, has to do not only with you, but also Jesus, who was himself like a sheep led to the slaughter, and who was himself humiliated and denied justice. But in Jesus, and for all who follow him, This stony road of suffering is transformed into the highway of exaltation. In Isaiah 53, it goes on to say, Out of his anguish he shall see light. The righteous one, my servant, shall make everyone righteous. Or excuse me, make many righteous. When the unique story of shame is refracted through the story of the cross and resurrection of Jesus, it becomes a narrative of redemption and restoration and hope. So the same is true for us. When we approach scripture, it not only brings us words from ancient times, it brings us words for today. Words that can change our lives. Has this ever happened to any of you? Have you ever read the Bible wondering, what do I make of this? How how does this speak to my present circumstances? And then it hits you like lightning. You gain some new understanding of scripture, some new insight from God, and it helps you reorient the way you live your life. For myself, growing up, especially the way we've traditionally read Scripture in Churches of Christ, I'd always imagined the Bible to be this kind of book of of data points. And if I just assemble the data points about whatever thing I'm concerned about in the right way, then I'll have the right answer to what I wanted. Find all the verses that support my argument. Find all the verses that support what I'm frustrated about. But then when I got to graduate school, and began to have guidance from my professors who were strong Christians constantly engaging Scripture, the Bible opened up to me in a whole new way. Scripture wasn't merely a resource, some sort of ancient Excel spreadsheet for me to plumb data points from. It was the story of God. And amazingly, the story of the Bible became my own story. Because I am a Christian, these are the stories of my past. The stories of my people and my God. Because I'm a Christian, I'm part of something so much bigger than myself. Something that spans all time in human history and works in the world with great purpose. And so when I began to see the Bible that way and read the stories in that light, Scripture took on a whole new dimension for me. About whom does the prophet say this? Scripture is words of freedom for us today. The final question we'll look at this morning, and uh, this is a Church of Christ favorite, by the way, is perhaps also one of the most profound of the story, and I think we're going to see it in a deeper way today. The eunuch asks, what is to prevent me from being baptized? The answer to this question is much more difficult than it seems on the surface. When we think about it, there are actually quite a few things that people could have thrown up as roadblocks to prevent this Ethiopian eunuch from being baptized. He was living in Ethiopia, for one thing. So he was cut off from the land of Israel. He was a eunuch, and thus in violation of the purity code. He was a member of the cabinet of the queen of Ethiopia, therefore loyal to the wrong sovereign. He belonged to the wrong nation, held the wrong job, and possessed the wrong sexuality. All of these things would have thrown up red flags for the first Jewish practitioners of Christianity. You have to remember, at this time in the history of the church, Christians did not consider themselves separate from the nation of Israel, or not Jewish. They saw themselves 
almost as a subsect of Judaism. So many of them held uh, onto their deeply held Jewish commitments. We see this get addressed by Paul in a big way in the book of Galatians later, but this morning we're talking about Philip. And Philip is going to respond differently than what many might have expected at the time. He heard the voice of the Holy Spirit speak a different answer to the man's question, what's to prevent me from being baptized? The Spirit answers absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. So the eunuch commanded the chariot to stop, and he was baptized right there on the spot. Walls of prejudice, walls of prohibition that stood for generations came tumbling down, blown down by the breath of God's Holy Spirit. And another man who felt lost and humiliated was found and restored in the wholeness and wideness of God's grace in Jesus Christ. I think, uh, and this is what I had written before, but I was thinking about it this morning, I'm trying to think about how to deal with this in our context. Because I, I think we do struggle with the same thing today in our churches. And we can talk about all the churches outside of Vandalia who do, but this is a sermon for the people of Vandalia Church of Christ, not for the church as a whole. And so the question that presses on us is, who's out there seeking God? Who is out there who genuinely want to live new and different lives, who want to be part of authentic community, and what prevents them from joining us because of walls we erect? Do we make it more difficult for people to be here than it really needs to be? Now, in the original sermon, I have a litany of things where I'm just like, this, 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 but I think about the church in general. I think in Vandalia, I want to be careful. We do a pretty good job of being very welcoming to everyone who walks through those doors in a way that a lot of churches in Lubbock um, aren't. And I don't want us to rest on our laurels. I think what this scripture is calling us to ask is, as we're doing a good job of reaching out to people who've traditionally been outside of the walls of the church, we've got to do the work together to ask ourselves, are we missing something somewhere? Are there people somewhere that we're not seeing? Are people who want to be in these doors that we're not doing a good job of saying, there's absolutely nothing that prevents you from being here? I'm opening up the question. I don't have answers <laughs> for it right now, but I think it pushes us to ask that, especially as I feel like we've done a good job of inviting so many people in here. So what maybe the eunuch is saying and Philip is saying, instead of resting on our laurels, what else are we missing out there? Because God's love is just constantly an invitation, wanting everyone to come in. So, what's to prevent me from being baptized? Absolutely nothing. How can we help people be connected to the God of human flourishing? I think the Bible has a lot for us this morning. This story of the Ethiopian eunuch and his conversion really points us to some truths about our own faith, that sometimes we need help trying to figure out how the Bible and our lives intersect. That scripture is not only stories of a time long gone, but has words of freedom for us today. It's our story. It's just not a story that I read. And that perhaps like Philip, we need to be better aware of what walls and barriers we put up around ourselves that keep people out. And we found these truths and some good questions that a eunuch asked 2,000 years ago. So this week as we're going in the world, may we too ask good questions and discover truths that lead us deeper into the life of God. Let's pray together. Lord, we're grateful for these stories. We're grateful for uh, the way your spirit led Philip to that eunuch, for the way that the eunuch and uh, his conversation with Philip demonstrate God's purposes in this world, to bring humanity together under him in a way that human beings can truly flourish and find a good life framed by the love of God. I ask that as you're with us this week, help us connect to that moment in Scripture. Help us to find that flourishing and that good life in our own lives, but to connect other people to it as well. Give us the courage to ask hard questions about who are we leaving out? What boundaries, what barriers do we erect that keep people from coming to be a part of this community? And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen.